Assalamu alaikum. Um, and kul amu tu bkhair. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, very different topic. I will be shifting, although you are both um, within the same field, cornea. And that's actually exactly what my uh, title is about um, and where I got this idea from. So before I start, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Sarah Muhammad Shakir. I graduated uh, from King Saud University Medical School in 2013, and then I went to uh, do pursue my uh, postgraduate studies. I did my residency in Toronto. Uh, that was for five years at the University of Toronto. I thought it would be cool to graduate uh, year 2020 as an eye doctor. Um, however, it wasn't that cool after all because COVID hit. Uh, this is here uh, pictured is my uh, cohort of residents uh, that I graduated with, with one of our mentors, Dr. Uh, Sean Singer. Um, and then I decided to do a subspecialty in uh, cornea, this tiny little piece of our body. Unlike our friends uh, and colleagues in dermatology who always boast about um, treating the largest organ in our bodies, my area of specialty is extremely small. 11 by 12 millimeters, 500 microns thick. Uh, however, it's always struck me how incredibly diverse the cornea is. And that's where I got the name of this, um, uh, this, uh, of this presentation. It's such a tiny footprint, but giant in power. And even throughout fellowship, um, I found that the different um, mentors I had, each of them developed or carved a niche for himself or herself where they kind of excelled. So pictured here is Professor Alan Slomovic, whose focus is ocular surface and dry eye disease. One of my um, uh, good friends, Dr. Randall Yulate, who some of you might have met during the Saudi Ophthalmology Conference, uh, his, he's also a graduate of this program, and now he's joining as staff uh, at UFT. But he is a, a great um, uh, middle segment surgeon uh, in Costa Rica currently. Uh, Dr. Josh Teichman uh, is the cornea specialist that works alongside or in the practice of Ike Ahmed. So he does all the complex anterior segment uh, surgeries when there is corneal decompensation. So he gets them referred from Ike. And then I have uh, Professor David Ruthman, who is, uh, his reputation precedes him. He's a master surgeon, a DMEC specialist, and he is a refractive guru. Uh, Dr. Hall Chu, who um, is uh, developed the uh, simblephron rings, which are essential in Stephen Johnson syndrome. Uh, Dr. Nira Singal, who leads all our keratoconus studies uh, in Toronto. And last but not least, the amazing Dr. Um, uh, Clara Chan, who is uh, the student of Dr. Holland. And she is really the only person in Canada that does true limbal stem cell transplantation uh, with like uh, the whole thing with immune suppression uh, in collaboration with our nef uh, nephrologists uh, so that they can uh, coordinate that service. All right, so with that, I would like to showcase different cases uh, with, uh, that show how, we're, how we deal with many things as cornea specialists. The first case, without further ado, is um, and that of an 83-year-old female who was referred to us for corneal decompensation in both her eyes. Her past medical history is significant for uh, pseudoexfoliative glaucoma. She had received two rounds of SLT in both eyes and had underwent cataract surgeries also in both eyes. Um, her visual acuity was reduced to 2400 in the right eye, and she was NLP in the left eye. Her examination showed edema in both eyes, more so on the left. The edema was significant inferiorly, and it was a hazy view into the eye. However, we knew from prior examinations that she had um, an uh, ERM. All right, so in summary, 83-year-old female. Uh, she has pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, left eye more than the right, uh, with uh, now pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. The left eye was deemed palliative, and that is uh, from our uh, colleagues in uh, glaucoma. So really, we just make sure that she, we made sure that she's comfortable. Nothing's going to be done there. If you can pull up this QR code here. Menti meter. Uh, we're going to be using it throughout the talk. I'd like you guys uh, to pull you guys. There's no right or wrong answer. Are you able to pull that or anyone just uh, thumbs up if you open the website? Thumbs up. Okay, great. So let's just launch the first, um, the first question. 
Let me see here. And oh, we can press in. Are you able to choose? OK, so the first one would be what I would like here. Sorry, one second. Here. Trying this for the first time, I'm used to polls through Zoom. OK. So if everyone just uh, tries to choose an answer, let's see. Oh, it's quite stuck. Okay, it seems like the internet is not helpful. Hmm. All right, we'll let it load. And I am assuming that we'll have different uh, impressions here. Let's go back to, is it a separate display? What we decided to do was a DMEC, and um, I'm sure many of you would have decided the same, or perhaps a DSEC, both very reasonable options. Uh, and I'm gonna show this video here. To As we start off, you can appreciate how uh, thick the, um, or how den dense this edema is, and like the view is super hazy. Um, it's very useful to always start with a superficial keratectomy. And then after scoring, uh, sorry, uh, marking for eight millimeters, I start my decimatorexis. And I, I'm really doing a normal pressure, but it seems like I'm indenting so much on the back of the cornea. Um, so I go to the like more normal looking side of the cornea and I continue my decimatorexis and it comes off nicely. And then I go back to this area here and it seems like I, uh oh, I created a stromal nick. Okay, so let's try and sever that. I go back and forth and try and cut this stromal nick so that I don't create further pull on or a tug on a, the stroma and just doesn't want to come off. Okay, let's go back to the normal looking cornea. And I'm, I'm pulling on the decimase, collecting the normal looking decimase membrane. And then, okay, we have to deal with this now. I keep on going back and forth, trying to find an edge, and I score right and left, and nothing wants to come. It's just acting very strangely. And at this point, it kind of downs on me that there's something more than just a decime at the, here. And uh, at that point, we, we are confident that this is a retrocorneal membrane and that we need to peel that with some uh, micro-instrumentation. So it's a membrane that is enclosing the retina, uh, sorry, the cornea, and uh, onto the uh, rest. It, it doesn't even respect just the cornea. As I peel it off, it comes off the back of the uh, cornea, the angle, and even the iris. And I'm pulling, I'm excited, I found something uh, news and I'm pulling and then suddenly look at the lower part of the eye oops there's a small iridodialysis there and blood starts to trickle in obviously I retreat and I inject viscoelastic give it some time to tamponade and clot let's go back in and remove this all right, so I'm coming out, it's just gonna bleed. So I decide to remove the whole membrane and then deal with the bleeding later. In retrospect, maybe I could have used scissors to cut this off instead of peeling it and potentially creating a larger iridodialysis. Thankfully, in this case, it was small or even ripping the um, iris blood supply. So uh, another method could have been just uh, simple micro scissors. Now I irrigate the hemorrhage and use air tamponade to allow this to clot. After that, the surgery goes on uneventfully. I inject the uh, decimes and do the normal tap and uh, nudge the disc down to open it. And really, the rest of the surgery goes on well. Just gonna... Okay. So day one, she was doing uh, well. She came down from 2400 to 2200 at a month's time. She's 2050. Um, and her, uh, these are her pre and post-op images. And you can appreciate her anterior segment OCT shows a nice compact cornea, and you can't even see the transplant. Uh, her visual acuity was limited, however, because she did have some hemorrhages and uh, exudates in the uh, retina. 
So on uh, sending, we sent these to pathology, and obviously anything you take out of the body is sent to pathology. This here shows a HNE stain showing the decimase membrane, and I'm just going to zoom out, or this is a lower mag, showing the scroll of decimase, and then this membrane that forms right behind decimase and has this fibrocellular structure to it. So there's a fibrous component and some cells. Um, the PAS stain highlights the basement membrane nature of the decime. And over here, this uh, is an immunohistochemical stain known as smooth muscle actin, which stains metaplastic cells positively. Other stains we used were pancuritin and CK7, which were negative. So what are retrocorneal membranes? Uh, we actually published this case uh, in just last summer uh, because we looked into the literature and this case was unique in the sense that it's one of the, uh, or the only case that I found in the literature to have presented with retrocorneal membranes following just phaco emulsification. So straightforward cataract, no complication, and pseudoexfoliative glaucoma. This was not pre uh, present in the literature. So these membranes were initially described in 1901 as a complication of penetrating keratoplasties. More recently, however, they've been used to describe a fibrocellular growth or tissue behind the decimase and, and cornea. In my search, I found that the term was very loosely used. Some people would use it to refer to fibrous downgrowth in, or epithelial downgrowth in, uh, and epithelial ingrowth, which are the same thing, or inflammatory membranes. These, um, this is obviously a very loose way of using the terminology. We know that fibrous downgrowth is very different and behaves very differently from the aggressive epithelial ingrowth. So I'm going to be more specific and say this, these are retrocorneal fibrous membranes. And when we reviewed the literature, this is the, um, the list of publications that reported these membranes uh, and whether they had the pathology uh, published or not. You can appreciate that the most common cause has been uh, penetrating keratoplasties in the recent uh, era of ophthalmology. Prior to that, extracap and intracap was a common cause for, um, for retrocorneal membranes, but we have not seen them after straightforward cataract surgeries using uh, phaco emulsification. One of the second more common, uh, um, sorry, another common one which I did not present here are retroprosthetic membranes, which we see after K pros and a prosthetic device implanted in the eye. Now, um, D sex is a, another common co cause, and you can see here Dr. Hendel Gatan, our very own, has published a, a, a case series, a large case series, where uh, of failed D sex, four of which had retrocorneal membranes. And also DMEX have been reported, but only a few really. Uh, it seems like only two with proven pathology and one without pathology. So in summary, or the take home messages of the, this case would be one, uh, just a surgical tip, visualization can significantly improve your vision. We did not appreciate this membrane prior to um, uh, going intra-op or surgically. Um, and even after we, we removed the epithelium, it was very difficult to understand what was going on. Beware of these membranes, and they can sometimes extend, as I mentioned, beyond the cornea onto the angle. And peeling them would require microinstrumentation. However, it can result in trauma to the iris and the angle. So be ready with your viscoelastic tamponade uh, and possibly air tamponade, um, or even using some micro scissors to uh, take them off. Okay, so switching gears, another case. Unless someone has any questions about the first one, I'm just gonna keep on going. All right, so the second case is, um, this is an 85-year-old male who presented initially to another physician. And then we, um, I'm just going to start the story from the beginning so that we can just flow with the um, events here. So the, this patient presented with flashes in his left eye for a few days, and he really uh, just had cataract extraction in both eyes. His visual acuity was reduced to 2060 in the left eye, and he was hypotenuse in that eye. Uh, on exam, there was a Seidel positive leak superiorly, and the rest of the exam was in keeping of a hypotenuse globe. There were decimies fold, the cornea is folded on itself. The other eye was aphakic, and the patient was wearing RGPs. 
The B scan also showed choroidals, again, in keeping with hypotony. So this patient has the preliminary physician's impression was that he had hypotony secondary to a Seidel positive extra cap wound. Superiorly, he took him to the OR, very reasonable, sutured him, made sure he's Seidel negative. Saw him the next day, 2060, pressure still did not come up. Wait, is that a Seidel positive? leak again. Okay, there's another Seidel positive leak superiorly. Okay, so he just took him again to the OR and put new sutures, made sure that he's not leaking. Saw him next day, same story. Still, there's a leak. What's going on? And 10 years later in his left eye in 2000, I intentionally skipped the medication list the first time. So let's go to it now. He's on mycardis, so hypertensive medication, avodart, benign prostatic hyperplasia, some vitamins, and this medication, Zeljanx, which is used for rheumatoid arthritis. Here's your clue number one. All right, clue number two. Now, if this patient had an extra cap wound that just opened up, maybe it would open up under an intact conjunctiva. So in that situation, you will probably see a bleb more so than a leak through both conjunctiva and sclera. Okay, so clue number three. So he mentions he's aphakic in the right eye and he wears RGPs, but he knows he has a lens and that was implanted in his left eye. And if we go back to the history of cataract surgery, it, now phaco emulsification was introduced by Kelman in 1967. However, it, it became, there was resistance at the beginning and then it became very popular and it was mostly the, likely the surgery he got, around 1990, it became popular. So his left eye probably got a cataract, like a phaco emulsification. He probably doesn't have an extra cap wound. Putting all things together, this points to a big melt situation rather than um, a dehist wound with the culprit being your not so friendly rheumatoid arthritis. If we were to review the causes of non-infectious scleritis or the classification, sorry, then you have anterior, that being anterior to your uh, recti insertion, and posterior being posterior to your recti insertions. So the anterior is divided into diffuse, nodular, necrotizing with or without inflammation. Those without inflammation, usually it's the other terminology for that is scleromalacia perforance, would present with painless, um, gradual change in the color of the sclera as the sclera thins out and you see the underlying choroid as well as um, it's, it's not likely to perforate unless this patient had trauma. Um, if it is with inflammation, usually there's a lot of edema, pain, and necrosis. And uh, however, we have found some patients in the literature that present really with minimal or no pain. And that's what we think our patient had. With necrotizing anterior scleritis, ideally this is a medical condition. Really, you want the medication to control the systemic disorder with aggressive immune suppression and prevent melting. However, should it become a surgical one and a perforation occurs, then your go-to or you, you need to do a tectonic patch graft. Um, you can use either sclera or cornea or whatever is available to you. In Canada, we're lucky we have an eye bank that is uh, massive in, in Ontario, so we, were, we had really good access to cornea tissue. But you can use dermis, you can use fascia lata, periosteum, um, as well as pedicle flaps from uh, conjunctiva and with Mueller's muscle. However, there is really no rule, role for sutures. As you saw, the patient will continue to melt and leak. So at the time we saw him, he was already counting fingers and uh, virtually had no pressure in the eye. Uh, we were able to appreciate that there was some vitreous in the AC and an I IOL that was there. So the diagnosis was a scleral perforation secondary to necrotizing anterior scleritis with inflammation in a patient known to have rheumatoid arthritis. This is my list for a workup. If I did not know that he had rheumatoid, uh, this, these are the tests that I would order. So at that point, we took him emergently to the OR to do a patch graft um, with exploration and repair, and we pulsed him with IV solumedrol, um, as well as uh, we gave him uh, oral uh, steroids afterwards with a quick taper. We contacted his rheumatologist to titrate up his immune suppression, um, gave him some anti-melt medications such as anti-MMP9, doxycycline, and antioxidant high-dose vitamin C. After the surgery, we kept him on Vigamox, prednisolone, and atropine, and this is his surgery. So 
You can see uh, the area where the sutures were placed superiorly. We begin by identifying the leak. And you can see he's still leaking. I start with doing a localized pyridomy to expose the area of necrosis. And there was a big hole there, so I used that to inject OVD uh, into the eye to tamponade the, uh, the vitreous and also um, help form the globe. We know that suturing is not going to help. I'm just using it as a temporary measure. So uh, definitive closure requires tectonic support, as we mentioned. At this point now, you want to size your graft. So you want to measure the area of necrosis. You can appreciate how white the sclera is. This is a necrotic sclera. So we want to make sure we cover all of that. So until the area where the bleeding starts, that's the size of your graft. And we used uh, cornea, which is a beautiful patch graft. It looks very nice. Um, and you can thin it out. So we designed the graft. I brought it back to further uh, dis decide how I will trim it. And I used a handheld trefine to just punch out um, this, like create a crescent-shaped uh, graft, remove the epithelium and the endothelium, and then bring it back. Um, before I suture it, uh, I decided to uh, thin out the edges so that I get a better closure uh, over top the sclera. And then you would just suture it uh, normally with 10 O to, um, ideally, obviously, to healthy sclera. Now, the other thing uh, that is important here is that you want this graft to survive. And survival requires blood vessels. The underlying necrotic sclera is not going to be sufficient. So you need to be able to pull a forward uh, healthy tenons, healthy conjunctiva. Sometimes you might need to dissect a posterior um, tenons flap to be able to keep this graft alive. Now here we're just doing um, an anterior vitrectomy to remove the vitreous that has prolapsed forward. And finally, I'm just pulling the healthy tenons and conjunctiva over top and suturing it. Thankfully, this patient did very well, and he healed. Um, over the next uh, six weeks, his prednisolone was tapered while his immune suppression uh, was um, upped, and he was referred back to his physician. So my take-home messages from this uh, this case is one, necrotizing anterior scleritis ideally is a medical condition, and hopefully you will never have to deal with it surgically, but if you do, then remember you want tectonic support to give time for medical treatment to regain control of the situation. Necrotizing scleritis is essentially an ischemic process, so it's a granulomatous inflammation with necrosis and ischemic vasculitis. Scleral blood supply is deprived, whereas in situations like PUK, you're trying to recess conjunctiva to keep away inflammatory mediators. Here, we're trying to pull forward um, blood vessels. So you want to uh, dissect a posterior tenons flap and bring it forward. Um, so that's case two. If no one has any questions, we'll keep on going. Again, shifting gears, different case. This I like to call Cloudy with a chance of IOLs. If you know Cloudy with a chance of meatballs, the movie. All right, so this is a 62-year-old female, referred to us for corneal decompensation in her left eye. She, was, um, uh, she had a cataract extraction in 1985. She was left aphakic and has been wearing contact lenses for years now. So she also has presumed Fuchs heterochromic uh, iridocyclitis or uveitis in her left eye. She was on three classes of anti-glaucoma medication. Her visual acuity was counting fingers. Her examination showed edema in that left eye with an atro uh, atrophic iris. Uh, she was aphakic, but there was a capsular remnant with a soma rings ring. And her dilated exam was difficult on the left eye, so a B scan was used to rule out any gross pathology. So in summary, this is a left, uh, a 62-year-old patient who has left corneal decompensation in the context of aphakia, glaucoma, and recurrent uveitis. Now, someone who has hypertensive uveitis 
and also endorses cold sores, you always got to think of herpes. So a herpetic uh, etiology such as endotheliitis or keratouveitis is uh, on the differential as well as aphakic bullous keratopathy, just straightforward aphakic bullous keratopathy. So we started her on a course of Valtrex and steroids to address any herpetic component. Not surprisingly, she did not improve. There was overt corneal decompensation at this point. However, thankfully we did that because she proved herself to be a steroid responder and she was not controlled on maximally tolerated medical uh, therapy and diamox. So she, we referred her to uh, glaucoma where they performed AMAD valve and I would rather get that done before the glaucoma, so before their cornea surgery. So one more time, left corneal decompensation, aphakic, Recurrent reviatus has AMAD valve now, maybe has an a herpetic component, will keep her on prophylactic dose of Valtrex, and has a fake keratopathy with unknown visual potential. What would you do? Uh, we discussed with the patient observation, Miro, which is the hypertonic, uh, uh, I think you call them sodium chloride drops here, and uh, or surgery. If you are going to do surgery, let's try this one more time, the pull. And there is, again, no right or wrong answer here. I just want to know what people would be doing. Would you do a PK? Is it working now? Would you do a, a staged surgery? A PK first, then a secondary IOL. Would you do an EK first, then a secondary IOL? A secondary IOL, then a PK. A secondary IOL, then an EK. Would you do a combined EK with secondary IOL? Would you do a combined EK with a secondary IOL? Or would you just do an EK? She's been wearing contact lenses her entire life. Might as well just go back to that. More votes. There's no right or wrong answer. Just want to know what you guys would do. Okay, so secondary IOL, then EK. Great. Combined PK and secondary, combined EK and secondary. Okay, so the majority, uh, they, they would do first the stage the surgery, do a secondary IOL for, okay, someone would do secondary IOL, then a PK. Great. Okay, wonderful. I really like the different approaches, and that highlights exactly uh, that it's really not one answer fits all. It's also a discussion with the patient. Okay, so there's another question I have. Let me see if I can move this. Yeah. If you were going to do um, a secondary IOL, some of you said secondary IOL first, what is your preferred technique? An AC IOL, an iris claw IOL, uh, like an artisan, or a pos posterior sutured IOL, something sutured to the iris posteriorly, uh, or a sutured scleral fixated IOL, or a Imani intrascleral haptic fixation. Okay, so six sutured to the sclera, one or eight to the sclera sutured, a few, a couple Yamanis. Okay, 13 sutured. Okay, so many would do a sutured IOL first. Wonderful. Or just a sutured IOL plus minus combined. If you were going to do an EK for this patient, would you uh, go for a DMEC or a DSEC? Two DMECs, one DSEC. Oh, three DSECs, more DSECs. Great. Almost an equal split, no? We'll give it one more go. Okay, so more so DSEC than DMEC. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, so um, we decided to do a combined approach. Uh, with a pars plane of vitrectomy, uh, with the Amani interscleral haptic fixation, as well as a DSEC suture pull through. Now, there's a re reasoning and rationale for each part of this decision. Um, so, in terms of the vitrectomy, well, anytime we're going to implant um, a, an, a lens behind the iris, we need to clean up. And she had a Sommerings ring, she had uh, a capsular remnant, so we're going to do that. Why a posterior approach when a lot of our retina colleagues prefer us to go anteriorly? I mean, I met both people on both uh, ends of the spectrum, retina surgeons who support us to go pars plana and others who don't. So this metal, middle segment surgery is always controversial. Um, anyways, so uh, why we decided to go pars plana? Well, because it does 
mean less incisions in the cornea. And when you're going to do a D second, you need a 10 minute air fill. You really would appreciate the infusion being out of the way uh, and not having extra pokes in your already mushy cornea. And then um, also removing the vitreous behind the iris fr from a posterior approach is just more anatomically friendly and allows for a better cleanup. Now, why a DSEC, not a DMEC? Now, one of my mentors who I've shown a picture earlier of uh, is uh, Professor David Ruthman. He uh, has told me that he tried to delete the word DSEC or remove this letter S from his dictionary. However, in uh, 2020, he, put, he looked at his results, and this paper came out of uh, University of Toronto. We had 15 patients uh, who had undergone a DMEC in vitrectomized eyes using his technique with a parse plana infusion. Um, and these, these surgeries are very challenging. They're very hard on your arteries. They're, they're not very easy. And we found out that their outcomes are actually not so great either. So they would have a high rate of retinal complications. So that was in 2020, a year after we published a, a study comparing the DMEX to DSEX. And uh, again, in vitrectomized eyes with the same approach with the pars plana for the DMEX uh, infusion. The post-operative visual outcome was similar. However, the DMEX group showed a higher rate of complications. So more retinal detachments, more CME, and more even graft detachments. So for eyes that are not really, you're not looking for a 2020 outcome, and um, they, they've had a vitrectomy, it makes sense, and you're doing this big combined surgery, it makes sense to go for a DSEC, and that was well, our choice. Now, in terms of Ayamani, um, and I think two of my colleagues in the audience would uh, maybe have different choices for the lenses, but uh, what we would go for is usually a, an ideal lens for Ayamani is a three-piece lens that has haptics that are flexible and malleable that will not break. Um, on uh, feeding them into your lumens or the into your needles. Ideally, for, ret for cornea surgeons, we would appreciate it being a hydrophobic lens so that we don't the lens does not calcify on our air or gas injection. And you want it to be foldable so you don't have to do a big incision through the cornea. So um, some of the lenses out there, these are the PVDF haptics. You might have heard of them. They are excellent haptics. They are malleable, soft, and really would go through a lot of pressure before they break, and I, I haven't seen one break. So what we used in Canada was the CT, Light, uh, CT Lucia. I'm not sure if they're available in Saudi. What we have here and I've been using is the Koa Avanci PU6AS. And I would always encourage you to go for the PU, not the PN. No one wants a yellow lens in their eye. Um, and the other uh, uh, option is a PMMA haptic. So these are um, three, the three-piece uh, Alcon lenses, MA60AC, or the three-piece J&J Sensar. Now, these haptics work. However, they're more brittle. And um, I wouldn't start with them if you're just uh, starting your um, Yamanis. Okay, so in terms of um, blood thinners, I find this also very interesting. So I'm quickly going to ask you guys because it's difficult to um, to pick on people because I don't know most of the audience. So I'm just gonna <laughs> have this pulled. Do you hold your blood thinners, antiplatelets, and anticoagulants prior to scleral surgery? Do you? Yes, always. Yes, only if the cardiologist approves. No, it's not needed. Okay, only five answers so far, so most people are, are saying no. Okay, no? Six and four, okay, almost an equal split. Okay, and I think, uh, yeah, this has been my impression with uh, other surgeons is that um, some people would, some people want. I personally don't hold it because I do my uh, subtenons in with a blunt cannula and uh, there is a case to be made that we are passing needles close to the ciliary body, and if a bleed happens, it's a disaster. But I I've, haven't seen that happen before. I've never had a problem or my colleagues. So I think really saving the patient's arteries are more important. All right, so let's go back here. But again, no wrong answer. Uh, for biometry, this is an EK, so we're going to use the patient's own case, and we are going to aim for myopia, uh, given the expected hyperopic shift for DSEC. Now, this procedure, 
starts off with, uh, as I said, septenons with a blunt cannula, and uh, we use bupifacane with lidocaine without epinephrine. And then again, to improve your visualization uh, as superficial keratectomy. Oh, can I stop here? No, nope, I can't. All right, so I'm just gonna try and, and speak through it. A very important tip, and this is one of the most important things for a Yamani, for a well-centered Yamani, you wanna make sure that your, um, your points and your marking is exactly 180 degrees apart for centration. And I like to mark not just the, um, the conjunctiva, but also the cornea, because the conjunctiva can move. Some people advocate creating a little um, pyridomy to make sure you're marking the sclera. I, I don't personally, but you can. And I just double check with my corneal mark that I'm aligned and I'm on 80 degrees uh, back. So this, this is the pars plana infusion. You pass it um, flush to the sclera and then dive in. Uh, it is very important to avoid the three and nine o'clock positions whenever you're passing anything uh, intrasclerally. So you're avoiding your long ciliary nerves. Um, and before turning on your infusion, you want to make sure that you're not under the retina, uh, so you don't create a big retinal detachment. I see Dr. Tarek Hinak, he would not like that. So we then would create, uh, I would start with my pars plana uh, vitrectomy. So again, the approach here with the pars plana is very anatomical. You will start with within the uh, iris. And one of the, uh, so this part of the video is sh uh, edited down from, th from 15 minutes to 30 seconds. It does take time to remove vitreous. And one of the tips I, I uh, wanted to share with my young surgeons is not to move quickly, because you really want to stay in place, eat, 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 and then move, stay, eat, eat, eat. So we're on cut IA. It takes a long time to clean up. And then you're going to use a second instrument to visualize uh, all around. This is uh, Cornea Protect, which is amazing in helping improving visualization as well as um, giving your assistant a break. So here we're doing a very good cleanup. Sometimes with a somering ring, you need to burp it out. But here we were able to just clean up with vitreous. When you're coming out, you come out on cut, no IA, to avoid pulling vitreous with you. So now here we're making your paras. Uh, the CT Lucia does not come preloaded like our Avanci here. So we do get the chance of testing the haptics. Uh, and this uh, on both, you test both haptics on both uh, TSK needles. So a TSK needle is a 30 gauge outer lumen needle and it has a thin wool, so large bore to fit this, um, uh, the haptic. The, uh, this, these needles were actually developed for dermal fillers. Um, they want to make as small as possible of a nick in the skin uh, with a large bore to allow the dermal filler to come through, but we made use of it in ophthalmology. So here, you're passing again flush to the sclera and then you're diving in. Uh, I used to go uh, one millimeter behind my mark, but now I just start at my mark and I tunnel through the length of the bevel and then dive down. I feed my first um, haptic with micrograspers. So if you are using um, a 27 gauge needle, then you might wanna feed more of the haptic into the lumen. Um, again, one of the ways to do is to leave your first needle and then do the second pass and pull both together. Uh, right now, what I do is actually externalize the first and that makes uh, feeding or docking the second or the trailing haptic more difficult but we'll talk about it in uh, the next case. So you pull out both either at the same time or one after the other, create your flange and bury them into the sclera. Now the next part of the surgery is preparing the DSEC. So for a DSEC, uh, again, we start with a, your normal decimatorexis. Here we're avoiding using OVD since we have a posterior infusion, which is helpful. Um, to uh, keep the pressure, uh, to the globe pressurized. Now this technique is um, a, a suture pull through. We use a 9O or a 10O proline on a CTC6 needle. Then we pass both uh, needles through the bucin and uh, flip over the bucin. You have to manage your spaghetti here. So you, the endothelial side goes first and the needle and all the way outside the limbus. The second, the stromal side is gonna go in almost two millimeters out of, um, into the, uh, sorry, in the limbus. And then you're pulling your, um, your DSEC using the suture. Then you suture it very lightly this suture stays on for a week and helps us in the cases of rebubbling. It keeps the, the cornea up and because 
these are vitrectomized eyes, and um, also this patient had, uh, I believe, glaucoma valve, or sometimes we are dealing with eyes that where the, the bubble will just go into the trab or gla uh, glaucoma tube, so having the suture is a nice added security. The patient was doing well 2120 on the first day, and on month six, best corrected vision or pinhole vision is 2060. She had uh, a cup to disc ratio of 0.8 with pallor which again, we counseled her on potential, visual potential. All right, so um, there are advantages for combining EK with a secondary IOL surgery versus staging them. However, this is a case-by-case -case selection and it is a discussion with the patient. Um, D-sex suture pull-through is um, our preferred technique. Uh, it provides uh, an, a method to deliver the uh, D-sec and also provides security for the graft. Uh, there are advantages for doing a parse plana, both infusion and vitrectomy, to do any work behind the iris. Um, that does put your infusion out of the way and is less corneal incisions, remove the cornea, uh, the vitreous in an anatomically friendly fashion. Um, and also the parse plana infusion is helpful in these eyes for both the decimatorexis and the desec delivery uh, as we avoid using an OVD. However, I will make a point that I switched to doing um, my infusions anteriorly, and my, uh, my uh, vitrector still goes pars plana. Um, so for a well-centered IOL, we talked about how important the marking is. And finally, bringing all of this back home to King Abdelaziz University Hospital, where I'm uh, very lucky to uh, work with amazing colleagues here. Uh, so let's talk about a case, a 62-year-old male, uh, who was referred to me for corneal decompensation in the left eye after complicated cataract surgery two years uh, prior, had developed fungal endophthalmitis. Um, my uh, friendly retina colleague did a very great job. He did a good cleanup, parsplane vitrectomy, capsulectomy, and intravitreal antifungals. The patient developed CME, uh, not unexpectedly, and uh, received an Ozerdix injection, which migrated anteriorly and was removed. So this patient now has a counting finger vision, and has stromal edema of the iridogenesis and is aphakic. This is his picture. You can appreciate the uh, endothelium is not great and is the cornea is thickened. The macula is dry. There is some pathology. Um, and I guess this is an autofluorescence <laughs> picture. I, last I remember from my retina and shows maybe some uh, scarring. So this patient has aphakia and uh, aphakic bullous keratopathy, status post fungus endophthalmitis, and complicated cataract surgery. Uh, his CME had resolved after an Ozerdix injection. Again, I'm going to do a DMEC with a uh, DSEC with Ayamani. And in this case, I really, uh, he did not have any vitreous, so I'm not going to do a pars plana vitrectomy. Other cases, I mentioned that I did switch, so I, I still do my an infusion anteriorly and the vitrectomy posterior. Again, this is an EK, so I will aim for my uh, use the patient's case and aim for myopia for the hyperopic shift. This is the lens that we have available here, Avansi, which is a, a Japanese lens. They'll uh, beware that the A constant on the box is actually, when you go to their website, is the ultrasound. Um, a constant, and I would not use that for my calculations. I would use the optical one, although it is optimized for SRKT. I would still use the uh, optical one over the ultrasound because the measurements were from an IOL master. Uh, I plugged this in and I aimed for a 23, so almost minus 75, minus 88, or minus one uh, power. So this was actually last week. Uh, I start off by, um, again, once more marking 180 degrees apart, a blunt um, cannula for my subtenons, going back two millimeters for the incisions. Here's my anterior infusion, SK to improve visualization. It's uh, choppy. All right, so your paracentesis, it's quite choppy. All right, so here, uh, it's a two, this is a 2.8 blade. The, uh, the Avanci, I think, uh, recommendation is 2.7. Um, again, this is preloaded, so I can't test the haptics. However, um, in this, I've never had a problem, thankfully. So we, lo we inject the lens and make sure the, the video is very choppy. Um, so I make sure that I stay above the iris plane and keep the trailing haptic outside the eye. As I mentioned, now I go from uh, where I marked and then I tunnel through the length of the bevel and then dive down and feed my haptic uh, into the lumen. 
And again, I also mentioned this modification. I now pull out and do my first flange. This makes it more challenging to dock the second because now you don't have as much room to push in your lens. However, um, one tip is to make sure that you, you don't leave a long segment of your haptic outside the eye. So just try to almost bury it. And then this is the second pass. This is a trickier um, haptic to, to uh, feed. Um, one of the tips is to make sure that the angle between the needle and the haptic is 90 or more so that you can feed it into the lumen. Again, so you're burning it to create a little flange. And uh, here I'm preparing my desec tissue. And um, this here is a decimatorexis with the infusion. Uh, what's very nice at our center is that we have an interior segment OCT, which is amazing. Um, however, I didn't want it to start this early on. You don't need it for this step. Uh, I'm feeding the, uh, the bucin, uh, the needles through the bucin, and then doing just the same thing we described earlier, where I pass the endothelial side outside the limbus, and then the second needle, which is the stromal side, is almost two millimeters or three millimeters in from the limbus. I deliver the tissue. and then put in, uh, tie the suture loosely and put in a small air bubble. Now what's very nice uh, about the OCT, the interior segment OCT, is that it actually shows us the interface. Here you can appreciate that there is still interface fluid. Maybe I wouldn't even have guessed that when I full, filled the eye completely with uh, air and, and I really pumped the pressure up. Um, so a little squeegee movement here, just squeeze out all that fluid. And now I'm sure that hopefully there won't be any interface fluid on week one. And the rest of the surgery really goes uneventfully. We do our 10 minute wait and titrate the pressure at the end. This is him on day one um, and I'm gonna see him tomorrow. Hopefully he's still attached. So uh, my take home messages from this is uh, intraoperative OCT is amazing if you have it. It helps ensure that the interface uh, issues are dealt with intraoperatively. Uh, anterior infusion, as I mentioned, um, with a pars plana vitrectomy for IOL work behind the iris, I find is safer and hopefully will not result in a retinal detachment. I still want my patients dilated and seen uh, at week one to make sure that the retina is okay. And it also makes sense for the flow of fluid and the vitrectomy to anatomically to remove um, where the flow coming from the front. And that is it. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to connecting with you all and uh, hopefully build great relationships with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for uh, these uh, interesting uh, cases. Uh, first of all, sorry to start uh, early. Uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I thought uh, she was preparing it, but she starts. So, uh, what the heck? Uh, so, we'll open uh, the floor for uh, discussion. Any uh, question, comment, or uh, concern from any of the audience? Yes, Dr. Saeed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah, for excellent uh, presentation and uh, nice cases, very well done. And uh, my comment regarding the patient with the leak and you used the uh, the corneal uh, batch, you might lead to more areas of leaking with the suture. Thanks God, things went smooth without uh, this uh, complication. And I might start with amniotic membrane, which I called sandwich technique. And I do it for many years. And this is will just only sealed and briefed uh, because this is secondary to um, um, maybe rheumatoid arthritis or whatever the cause and it will make a barrier between the conjunctiva and blood vessels and the sclera. So thank you very much, just a matter of comment. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And that, um, I mean, I, I wonder actually if the only problem is that he will continue, do you want to, would, would you suture it? How would you like just glue it on or, or how would you make sure that he's still not leaking and creating a bleb under? You already uh, make that area. Sometimes I put uh, glue, then I put the amniotic membrane over it. Mm -hmm. Then, so it will make as a barrier between the uh, conjunctiva and also the sclera and the limbal area. 
And because those patients, instead of having one area leaking, you might have multi-area of uh, leaking and even sometimes a cheese wiring and you will have uh, really a miss. Yeah, so. no, I agree with you. And that's why we, I made the point of uh, making sure that we go out to healthy sclera and we're passing our sutures through healthy sclera so that you're not passing through this necrotic friable tissue. But it's a great uh, comment, thank you. Uh, this is why I suture the amniotic membrane over the sclera mm -hmm. and I try to avoid the cornea and that area so it will not lead to uh, milking. And it's a matter of just only supporting rather right. than uh, fixing. Okay. And uh, with the, it will work as a batch. Yes. And it will prevent and minimize uh, inflammation. Yeah, great points. Agree. I mean, for me, I feel like tectonic support from uh, a cornea will still be needed as long as you're making sure your suture passes are in healthy, uh, not necrotic tissue. Uh, but it's interesting to see that this has been working for many years. Thank you for your comment. You know, sometimes uh, with this uh, chronic and odd leak. Uh, epithelium tend to grow in and uh, form a fistula, which make it uh, very difficult to close. So I remember uh, a case I had to just elongate the leaking parts and just scrape it from inside and suture it. So this might be considered in such cases as well. Any other question? Uh, Dr. Said again. Uh, also regarding that patient with the retrocorneal membrane, yep. most likely the patient had the dismal detachment during surgery and uh, damage to the corneal stroma, and which lead to the inflammation uh, post-surgery, and even might have uh, vascularization and uh, having that membrane. So uh, this is my feeling, patient had uh, dismal detachment with uh, its uh, secondary complication. Yeah, it could be the etiology, but um, the point, I guess, we, we have not seen any uh, retrocorneal membranes following cataract surgery alone, even though I think uh, decimate detachments happen quite frequently. So it's still, it, we, we can speculate about the cause, but it's, it's still interesting that it happened. Uh, this is how we have lost detachments. Sometimes it right. rolls up and leads to inflammation. Mm -hmm. So this is most likely the cause for this patient. Gotcha. Right. Any other? So in uh, basic uh, cases, uh, mm -hmm. when do you prefer to do a suture pull through versus, versus the, the pulling one? Regular abuse. So I, I think for the, um, I, I've tried both techniques and both work pretty well. Um, I think if, if you have the right needle, which is the CTC6, it's nice to have uh, because it provides security for that first week because patients are likely going to detach during that first week window. And that being said, uh, I think, and, and when they detach, having the, the suture holding this cornea away when you're doing your rebubble, it helps. Um, but I, I have done both and I have done the pull through. I think it's very easy to do if you have the right forceps. Um, for So uh, if the eye is reasonable and you don't think it's gonna detach, I think it's still a very reasonable approach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Saram Abdullah Khan, pediatric ophthalmologist. I really like the, the cases that uh, you presented regarding the scleral fixed IOL. Do you have any experience with this uh, Yemeni technique in children or other techniques that you use in children? Okay, so one of the drawbacks of doing, sir, of doing your fellowship in uh, Toronto is that we have sick kids and they actually deal with all <laughs> the kids' uh, surgeries. So um, we don't see a lot of kids. Uh, they go to uh, Dr. Asim Ali and Maris Kandari, who I've worked with during my uh, did, since I did my residency there. Uh, but uh, I haven't done uh, any Yamanis on kids. I have heard them starting to do it. So I would, I, I can, if you like, we can connect. I can ask them and, and see what their experience has been. Uh, personally, I haven't, um, and I don't think any of the staff I worked with have so far. No. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Dr. Said? Not much of a difference for Yamanis, you mean? You're right. Yeah, here's your answer. <laughs> Great to have wonderful expertise in this room. Okay. Dr. Rafa? Uh, 
thank you so much, Dr. Saida, for our amazing uh, take on uh, some of the very interesting uh, cases. Um, I want to go back to the case where you used the needle pull through. Um, have you used it, for example, in cases with deeper ACs, posteroidoplasties? Because I have encountered some of the cases where uh, I have difficulty keeping the DASIC graft and maintaining the air postoperatively. Uh, I end up having the detachment and the air wouldn't stay. Uh, I yeah. noticed that more with grafted eyes where they have the protruded graft and the AC is much deeper yep. uh, than before. So uh, for you're talking about a DSEC under a PK, yeah. right? Yeah. So I um, my preferred technique, I've been doing actually more DMEX under uh, PKs. Uh, however, I think uh, two things. One, um, the having a suture pull-through technique is, is excellent and very helpful in any complex eye. And really, uh, in Toronto, and where I trained, and we used to not do DSEC unless it's a complicated eye. So if I see on the list that there are DSECs, I know it's a tough day. <laughs> if it's a DMIC, then it's a, we'll breeze through it. So basically, um, uh, the I, you could do a DSEC under a PK. My technique is usually DMEC under uh, a PK and just undersize so that it's uh, smaller because we know interface issues can also affect your uh, attachment rate. Uh, but I think it's very reasonable to still use a DSEC with a suture pull through. It's an amazing technique. And as you said, I mean, you'd rather have that security instead of having dealing with a, a DSEC that's plastered on your, on your uh, iris. Yeah. Good uh, question. Was capsular support or uh, there was no capsular support? No, so the, there was a, a little bit of a remnant of a capsule, but it wasn't really. She's been, uh, I think, uh, aphakic for years, if I recall co correctly. Was it? Yeah, she she had a earlier surgery, and since 1985. So yeah, I wouldn't really bank on that capsule. Are you thinking a salcosiol or some kind of uh, like like? It. Is there like any UBM or any individualization of the? Uh, the yeah, no, we didn't really. We just took it out. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other question, comments? So, uh, thank you very much for uh, attending. Uh, see you. Thank you. Thank you all.